Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome guests, welcome Berggruen Institute partners, welcome students, welcome everyone who's come out this evening for uh, our Possible Worlds Lecture by Kim Stanley Robinson. I'm David Skaberg, very pleased to welcome you here. Um, the Possible Worlds Lecture Series has emerged as an effort, uh, a partnership between the Berggruen Institute on the one hand and UCLA on the other, especially the Division of Humanities at UCLA, really built around uh, a notion that's best captured in a motto of the Berggruen Institute, that ideas matter. The belief that ideas introduced to groups of thoughtful people listening thoughtfully can change the world. Our idea all along has been to find those places where the goals, the mission of the Berggruen Institute and the mission of the Division of Humanities come together. And that's really around the potential of creative and critical thought to identify problems in our current world and to point out possibilities of solution in future. Earlier speakers uh, during the remote period of this lecture series history included Harvard philosopher Danielle Allen and Chilean architect Alejandro Aravena, both of whom addressed questions of social difference and of the possibilities of bridging and addressed these questions in really new ways. This is the first time we've been in a room together for the Bruggeren uh, lectures, uh, and I'm very pleased that we're here together. While Zoom was an excellent tool, and while we are indeed live, stream, live streaming today's lecture so that we could have the access that was so great about the pandemic period, um, I for one think that gathering in a room and creating relationships uh, that go along with the ideas is a very strong way to go forward and furthers the reception of those ideas. Thank you again for being here. I'd now like to introduce Nils Gilman, the Vice President at the Bruggeren Institute. Thank you very much, David. Um, we live in a world that is experiencing great transformations, culturally, politically, economically, environmentally. Um, the Bruggeren Institute's mission is to develop foundational ideas that can address these great transformations. This is one reason why we've decided to partner with UCLA to create the P Possible World Series, where we are inviting some of the world's leading thinkers to present ideas that can potentially change the world by addressing these great transformations. Today, we're uh, delighted to be able to welcome the legendary science fiction author, Kim Stanley Robinson, who has for more than three decades produced award-winning science fiction that is focused especially on questions of climate change. Stan recently refer re uh, returned from the COP26 summit um, in Glasgow, uh, where he was invited as a speaker for the conference's Art and Imagination series. Um, he's the winner of multiple awards, including the uh, Arthur C. Clarke Award um, for Imagina Imagination in Service to Society, and has been named a Hero of the Environment by Time Magazine. Stan's the author of more than 20 books, um, including internationally uh, acclaimed Mars Trilogy, as well as most recently, uh, his book, The Ministry for the Future. We believe his ideas are vital in uh, informing the dialogue and inspiring action to address climate change and the political challenges associated with climate change. Um, and now I'll turn it back to David uh, to discuss uh, tonight's program. Thank you, Nils. Um, Directly following Stan's remarks this evening, we'll be welcoming Professor Ursula Heise to moderate an interview here with Stan. Um, Professor Heise is the chair of the Department of, of English and also the director of LENS, which is the Lab for Environmental Narrative Strategies in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Um, during this portion of the program, uh, we'll look forward to taking questions from the audience, that is during the, the discussion a bit later. Now, I'd like to welcome Kim, Stan Kim Stanley Robinson. Well, thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Nils. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and uh, thank you, Ursula, in advance. This uh, marks um, more than a half dozen events that Ursula and I have done together at UCLA or elsewhere around the country, and it's a uh, pleasure to be doing another one. So, um, we, which is to say the 
the humanity on this earth are standing on the edge of creating a mass extinction event would hammer humanity, but also be um, the sixth great mass extinction event in Earth's history and uh, unrecoverable from, except maybe 25 million years later, the repopulation. I don't wanna talk about that. Um, for one thing, everybody knows it, and I have, a, I have a dislike of telling people things that they already know, um, although that is almost inevitable, but not this time. I will say that the, the latest IPCC report from August is uh, like an alarm going off in a hotel and needs to be attended to. And then the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climatology, uh, uh, Johan Rockstrom, has um, made a Netflix film called um, Planetary Boundaries, I think, and a book that goes with it, Planetary Boundaries. If you're interested, what both of those reports, a, a kind of a great summarization by Johan and a full explication by the IPCC shows that um, we're very close to creating runaway catastrophes, ecological and biospheric, that even if we decided to try to claw back from them, we wouldn't have the power to do so. So that's where we're at. What I do want to talk about today is uh, COP26, because I'm just back. I'm still reeling. It was the first COP I've ever been to, and I have not yet collected my thoughts, so I will scatter them in front of you here and um, then try to talk more about what we might take from them. Um, Many of you might know a lot more about COPs than I do. Congress of the Parties. Uh, this was the 26th one. It moves around the world. It's UN. The Paris Agreement is the, the crucial COP of Paris in 2015. Um, and so uh, I was invited because I wrote the Ministry for the Future, in effect. And this was a novel about the Paris Agreement over the next 30 years working and to make a kind of a, a best case scenario going forward that you could still believe in when you were done with the book. And that clearly um, not just struck a nerve, but it, it filled a hunger that people had, particularly in that community. So I was there, my home base was the, the UN's pavilion, Future Resilience Labs. Did five or six events there. I, I, I cram myself into their office to eat lunches and take naps, and you know, it was a kind of a home base for me. And at one point, the woman, Coco Warner, running the home program, she said to me, Stan, who invited you to COP26? And I was thinking, damn, I thought you did. <laughs> and I was thinking, um, I don't even know who invited me. And I had to unpack that a little bit and, and ask around. And it turned out that I was, um, I had been invited by the high champion for COP26. That's his official British title, the high champion. This is England for you. Uh, a, a, a government official named Nigel Topping, a great guy, and um, what a year he had uh, gearing up for this thing. And he had indeed read Ministry for the Future and in a podcast he ran with Christiana Figueres, who is a Costa Rican diplomat who got the Paris Agreement written in 2015 and as a kind of heroic figure, um, they were the one that um, w inspired Nigel to go ahead and invite me and he gave me a red badge, which is to say that I was um, free to go anywhere I wanted. Um, it's the Congress of the parties, I was a party to the Congress. And so there were observers who had yellow badges. There were um, a, a UN workers who had blue badges, by far the most powerful in getting around. But the red badge was for negotiators. Now, I was not a negotiator, and it would have been inappropriate to speak. But Nigel just laid that on me so I could go where I wanted to. And that made it interesting. Because as Nigel had said earlier on, to me describing it, a, a COP is a combination of a negotiating session a trade show, and a circus. And I figured, that being the case, that I had obviously been invited to the circus as probably one of the clowns. 
Um, and that actually overstates by far how important I was at COP26, because clowns are actually very important to uh, circuses. They're like the main act, and I was not anywhere near that. Um, but I was, uh, I was there in part just because they wanted me to see it, rather than wanting me to contribute much. Although I did talk an awful lot to various groups of various kinds once they found out I was there. And mainly these were people who had read Ministry for the Future who wanted me to say more. But for me, what it meant was I got to go into the negotiation rooms. So these were rooms about this size, but often, but temporary buildings out on the parking lot of a convention center that was so full of other things that the actual negotiations were stuck out in, in temporary buildings underneath um, tents. And they had... Um, rectangular tables with chairs around them, and the representatives from each nation had their national card in front of them, like these reserve cards with their nation, uh, which were to be treated as the equivalent of national flags. So they were very uh, careful with these little placards. And when you wanted to speak, you tilted your placard up on end, and the moderator for this session would see that, get you in a sequence, and only turn on your mic when it was your turn. You would say your piece. There was obviously a, an ethic of don't go on too long, um, stick to the point. And by that I mean like one minute type um, remarks as they worked on things. And they had and the meetings were listed on a big board and they were fluctuating. It isn't as if this schedule was set in advance. It was being revised hour by hour as different teams needed to talk more about different points in the negotiation. So um, since the trade show is kind of like a I don't know, Comic Con or any other trade show, that part of it was quickly less interesting. It was sad to see how you had to pay for your space. So a country like Abu Dubai had a gigantic space, whereas all of the Francophone countries of West Africa had a little closet in the corner. I mean, this is how trade shows work. And this was a kind of an image. It was a good uh, objective correlative of the world situation of rich and poor nations. But in the negotiation sessions, here's what I saw. It was about 60% young women, by which I mean women in their 30s. It was about 10% men, even older than me, in their 70s, with briefcases and limps and, you know. Um, and then it was about, let me see if I get this right, about 10% older women, older than the 30-year-olds, and the people in around 40, 30 to 40, hard to tell, and about 30% maybe youngish men. Now, I realize that adds up to about 110%, but there were a lot of people there. <laughs> so, um, but nevertheless, think about the, these were lawyers and diplomats with um, expertise in specific uh, articles of the Paris Agreement that was their job to negotiate with all the other nations of the world. So one time I watched about 40 of them um, talk for an hour about whether there should be one table or two to demonstrate some data and whether in these tables the information should be in rows or in columns. Now I love that because for one thing, my wife is a scientist who works in statistics, and she very often has had, a, had similar conversations right next to me with other scientists, because how you display data is actually important in comprehending it. So this was not trivial. And then they were arguing about phrases, uh, the wording of phrases. So I'm a writer. This was beautiful. It was, they were not writing, because the documents, were, they were often working on an already written document and revising it. If you bracketed something, that means you're throwing it out. So they had their own language for things, and they were arguing right down to individual words and commas. So there was something admirable about that because this kind of stuff matters. And it wasn't just, of course, the, the rows and columns. I mean, that was a technical point. I also saw a much more intense negotiation as to whether the carbon credits that had been gained by countries under the Kyoto Protocol ought to be saved and lifted over into the Paris Agreement. All of the developing nations that were speaking up were saying, heck yeah, we need those credits, that's money in our account, and we did that work. All of the developed nations were saying, the Kyoto Protocol is a dead issue, why don't we start fresh with the Paris Agreement? It, was, it wasn't naked power politics, it was perfectly clothed and polite. 
but it was power politics and it was rich versus poor. It was developed world versus developing world in terms of that particular argument and it got quite intense. Um, so there's a famous line out of this whole thing where Greta Thunberg said uh, it was all blah blah blah. And then, as Nigel Topping said, no, I mean, we're actually, those of us who are loving this thing, we are going rah, rah, rah. And I said, no, it's in between. It's law, law, law. It's law. So it has sentences that have power. These sentences will be transformed into laws and money. Now, this is not direct, because COP, of course, is advisory. It's not, there's no sheriff involved. These are promises not um, treaty obligations, and there's a huge legal difference between those, and it's one of the many ways in which the COP process is a little insufficient. But um, these are public announcements of intentions by nation states. And so um, a public announcement of an intention, think about uh, a marriage, for instance. Think about a wedding. Well, that's just a public announcement of an intention. Nobody is going to throw you in jail if you get a divorce later, if you break that promise, blah, 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 blah. These are the, a marriage, a, a wedding could be, you could say, well, that's just blah, blah, blah. You know, you've got to actually put your money where your mouth is. You have to live it, et cetera, et cetera. But public intentions do matter. So in that sense, I thought something real was happening there. Also, we live in a, a world of sovereign nation states the Westphalian system, and sovereignty is very jealously held by nation state governments. When you get to something like COP, it resembles in certain ways the European Union uh, and other such bodies, even up to the UN itself. Nation states are turning into member states, and a member state is not quite the same thing as a nation state because it's a member of a larger body that might contravene the sovereignty of the nation state. So in that sense also, there was something important going on there. And there are other good designs to the COP process that came right from the beginning. For one thing, there's the, what they call ratcheting, that uh, nations are enjoined to make their promises um, ever more ambitious and challenging and binding as the years go by, and to bring those promises to subsequent COPs. Um, there's also uh, the idea of climate equity, and they fought that one at Paris, um, tooth and nail. And the people who got phrases in about climate equity, which is to say the developed nations that have burned the most carbon and historically were colonial and imperial powers and hammered the, the, the de developing nations that have burned less carbon but are taking the hit first of climate change damage, that there should be equity, that the developed nations should do more and should pay for some of the loss and damage for the developing nations that don't have the capital to pay for it. These are all huge strengths. And I guess what I would say is that um, COP26, the Glasgow Climate Pact, had some big features in it of importance that went, meant that it wasn't um, uh, a failure as such. It wasn't a gigantic success. It was not a complete failure either. Agreeing that 1.5 is as high as we want temperature to go, that's new. Agreeing to phase down coal, even mentioning a fossil fuel in any COP agreement ever, that was new. There were all kinds of side agreements being made and there were gestures being made by China and by India in terms of when they're gonna go to net zero. And the United States declaring it would go to net zero back in perhaps it was August before COP, was a, an encouragement to the rest of the nations to, to do the same. So there were lots of things going on under the umbrella of the Glasgow achievements. But, there is a but. Um, the original design of COP was such that it's a consensus model. All 190 nations that signed the agreement need to sign off on every agreement that comes out of every COP. 100% consensus. Well, this is rare. And you can imagine, uh, it explains immediately why the statements are, are cautious and moderate because they have to be written in a way that every nation will agree to sign on that. Big um, disagreements happen over that, but it also enforces a, a, a certain uh, cautious slowness to try to keep everybody on board or else it doesn't work at all. You come away from certain meetings 
Copenhagen, uh, Madrid, was famous um, COP meetings where people stagger away feeling like um, a chance was lost and an agreement never, didn't get to consensus. The other uh, problem I would say is that the ratcheting system of making, uh, increasing your promises can stick along the way as people don't keep their promises. And here we have the problem that n nobody ever really gives up money. That there's a stickiness to money in people's minds that the, even the vaccines are, are a great example of this. A few billion dollars worth of vaccines might have saved uh, millions of deaths, thousands of deaths, hundreds of thousands. But that amount of money was too much for the developed nations to just give to the developing nations. And um, in our system of, of a profit and loss, in the late capitalist system, that kind of thing was going to happen. So loans, well, yes, a loan is going to be paid back with interest. But gifts, not so much. So I came away with the feeling that the COP meetings are admirable and important, and they're better than not having COP by a long shot. And they have, they harken back to something that was said when I was young, the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. This matters, it really does. But it's not gonna be enough by its own. Um, it's a clearinghouse. It's even a spectacle in a society, the spectacle so that everybody can speak in one sentence on social media and make a judgment. So people like these spectacles, they like these, can we put the whole problem into one uh, bullseye and then shoot at it or defend it as the case may be. That's not the way it works and it can't happen that uh, cop meetings alone are gonna do the job. Um, it's also the case that the intent of the COP meeting, to decarbonize as fast as possible, people are going to be fighting that. They're going to be trying to burn carbon in these next 30 years on purpose. Uh, in, indirectly, you could say that they will be fighting to create a mass extinction event, given what the scientists have told us. That sounds peculiar and ominous at best, and yet it's gonna happen. Now why? Well, because this world runs by the highest rate of return. That's the law, that's the algorithm, let's put it that way. Um, uh, corporate leaders and national government leaders have a um, fiduciary responsibility that is legal and national leaders have a patriotic duty that is um, overwhelming to them that they need to get the highest rate of return. Now, highest rate of return really goes to private capital which is huge in this world, a force um, for creating human work, for investments in, in uh, human labor and on one task or another. And the truth is that a giant sewage system being built to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, creating literally billions of tons of dry ice for which we have no use whatsoever, that's not the highest rate of return. Therefore, it won't get invested in. And this is a big problem. It immediately points out that um, when private investment won't go to the necessary work, that we have what has been usefully called capitalist realism with teeth. Because if we follow capitalist realism of, of always investing in the highest rate of return, whatever it might be, then we are no alternative, as Thatcher would put it, to the mass extinction event. No alternative. Then there's another problem. The petro-states, so-called. These are nation states that uh, have vast reserves of fossil fuels. And let me put it this way. We can burn about 500 gigatons more fossil fuels before we hit that 1.5 degree C limit, uh, rise in temperature. 500 gigatons. We're burning about 40 per year. You can run the math. But, however, about 3,500 gigatons have already been identified in the ground around the world. And lastly, very importantly, about 75 to 80 percent of those fossil fuel reserves are um, owned by nation states, by nationalized companies, not by ExxonMobil or Royal Dutch Shell or other private fossil fuel companies but by nations themselves, 
And many of these nations depend on their national income on selling that fossil fuel. Up to 63% of their government income, and this is for countries like Russia, Nigeria, it can go on, um, Canada, Australia, United States, Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, even China, and India. Um, there are some nations that have a more diverse economy economy than others. There are true petrostates where almost all of their income comes from selling fossil fuels that then will get burnt. 3,000 gigatons of stranded assets. I did my English major um, back of the envelope, literally back of an envelope math, checked it with my mathematician wife. She um, was startled at my um, the assumptions I was making. Uh, as to the price of fossil fuels, because these are entirely notional and hypothetical, but taking the current price of a barrel of oil and running it for the whole 3,000 gigatons, you get something like $1,600 trillion. Now, if that much money is stranded, the nations that are going to be taking the hit that their government income is, depends on, they cannot forgo that money without a general crash of their economies. Mass unemployment, disruption, overthrow of the governments, chaos and disorder. So um, they are caught in the necessity of dragging their feet in COP um, negotiations to uh, decarbonize, because that would hurt them. Then also running fire sales, selling it cheaper and cheaper to nations that really need it, are burning it themselves for countries like South Africa or other countries where the burning of fossil fuels is what keeps a big part of their population out of immiserated lives. It's their energy source right now. And until they get clean energy, it's their only energy source. So thus, again, the mass extinction event. So OK, um, I, um, to talk about Optopia, the best possible world given the situation they're in right now, I have somewhat painted myself into a corner. But then again, this isn't me in a, in a fictional scenario. I'm just describing the world situation, and everybody has to recognize that this is the case. This is the dilemma, that there will be um, nation states and individuals working very, very hard to create the mass extinction event, while the other, other citizens and people of this world will be working very, very hard to decarbonize and fast enough to avoid the mass extinction event, we are doomed to that particular political battle. And it would be a good thing if we could finesse it so that um, there aren't huge winners and losers, but that everybody comes out with something. So um, there are a couple ways of dealing with this. Well, there's several, and I'm going to list them. For one, what's the highest rate of return except for an index? It's a metric. It's not a, a real thing, nor is it a number that happens without a whole lot of crunching, grinding, um, creation of externalities, ignoring, uh, sh shoving costs under the carpet, and, and creating a number that looks like profit um, or shareholder value, but in fact has been concocted um, by ignoring certain things, including social reproduction, the work that humans do to reproduce humans as, um, as free labor that uh, capitalism and profit itself is parasitical on. Without the free work that we do to take care of each other, there would never be any profit at all. But um, that's not counted either. Hard to count. Very hard. So um, nevertheless, especially since I'm talking at a university, the possibility of creating a new rubric a new system of measurement that has best rate of return or healthiest rate of return or um, real long-term um, good for the biosphere and for humans um, act, uh, measurement. So it's not even a rate of return so much as it is a new rubric to measure what we do and calculate it as such. This would still be economics. But the axioms on which the economic system were based, the goals that it would be trying for, would be completely different than the ones that exist in neoliberal capitalism. So this is work. This is actually disciplinary work in the social sciences and in the humanities and in philosophy. Economics is all these things at once. It's basically quantified ethics, and it's also power, a power relation. 
a description of a power relation that if you accept the power relation that 1% of the population of the planet should own as much capital as the um, poorest 50% of the world population. If you accept that the United States with 5% of the world's population has 70% of its capital and 800 mili military bases spread around the world, very freedom-loving country, it's just doing good by everybody to have that situation, of course. But these calculations are based on axioms. These, is, these, are, these are fundamental goals of a society that then get calculated by what's called economics. What you would want to do is to take it up to the level of political economy, um, re-gauge the algorithm by way of new goals, and see if you could actually create that algorithm in the way that economics does with their vaunted um, quantitative equations. They're sometimes real equations, sometimes pseudo equations. Um, different mathematicians will give you different ratings uh, on what they think of in terms of the math of economics, but nevertheless, calculations are being made. And quantification is not the villain here. Quantification, depending on the, on the axiom that you're uh, working towards, it's the axioms that need matter and could be re-jiggered. Re, re now, if, if decarbonization was the best return, you would have a different rubric. And now, then, we're in the world that we're in. We have this decade to get things done. So what can we do with the current existing system that might um, finesse the bad fate that I've described for us? Um, one thing is being called the carbon coin. And I want to immediately say that this is fiat money from central banks. It's not a cryptocurrency. It's not a non-fungible token or anything like that. The central banks of the world need to all together back a payment for decarbonization so that you get paid for decarbonizing rather than having to pay for it or take a hit financially for it. It's being called the carbon coin. None of these are my ideas, by the way, and I'm going to tell you about some of the support for them that I've found out since I wrote Ministry for the Future. So a carbon coin, you, you sequester 100 tons of carbon, either as an individual or as a town or as a nation or a region, and you get one carbon coin. You trade it on the currency exchanges. It's backed by the central banks who are maybe selling long-term bonds that are really long-term bonds that they're backing as central banks. Kind of a sure thing. You can't make it too much of a sure thing or you've got a liquidity trap. The economists could dance on the heads of these ideas and make it work, but a carbon coin would be an important addition to making decarbonization something that you could actually make your living doing rather than um, pay a cost for. It's also sometimes called carbon quantitative easing. So we know what quantitative easing is because of 2008 and because of the pandemic. People, um, central banks, um, made up new money is the, is the best way to put it. And, and put it into the system in 2008 to keep liquidity going, in 2020 to keep from dropping into a depression instantaneously. And that quantitative easing, for 2008, it's reckoned to somewhere between five and $13 trillion. And it's an indication of how weird the system is that that's as good an estimate as you can make. Um, but, uh, and in the pandemic, nobody's calculated that yet, but it's surely trillions. And I wanna make a little side point that every time a private bank makes a loan to a, that's new, that customer goes away and has real money. The bank only has 2% of the loans that they've put out there as assets in hand, maybe 3%. They've fought that like dogs. They don't want to keep any money in house. If everybody defaulted on their loans at once, the bank could only pay about 2% of it out. So when they make a loan, is that not new money that the central banks didn't back? Here I need economists to help me. I'm out of my depth, but I find it curious to think that, um, that some people are deadly afraid of quantitative easing by governments when it's ordinary practice for private banks making loans. Help me with that one. I don't understand it. Um, carbon taxes, of course. This is called paying the true cost or carbon, putting a price on carbon as the president of the World Bank begged the world to do. And this is legislative action, and of course, people don't like taxes, but if it was a pass-through agreement where you taxed carbon in a progressive way so that um, people who needed it for their lives, like truckers, 
there would also be a fee bait. So in other words, it would come back to you. Uh, citizens, like Alaska citizens, getting money from the Alaska pipeline. Um, so that it might not be thought of as being taxes in the ordinary sense. Um, but we need a true price on carbon and not the incredibly subsidized and, and um, false price that's on carbon now. That is, it's, we're charging ourselves way less than it's going to cost future generations in loss and damage. So fossil fuels are unnaturally cheap. So bringing them up to the, the real price would be a shock, but it could be handled. Then, now this, here again I need help big time. First of all, blockchain, I think I get it, but um, I wouldn't be wanting to write the code for it myself. Um, and so now there's non-fungible tokens. In other words, the whole world of cryptocurrencies, there are people at Glasgow talking about, you could invest in a wild animal you could invest in a forest. These would be non-fungible tokens. They would be cryptocurrencies where you as a direct citizen would invest in a shared and distributed um, ledger, blockchain, essentially a people's bank where everybody who put something in then also had part of it. Uh, and here I began to drown in my own um, non-understanding is that maybe the gift economy? Is that maybe an investment on a long shot with your surplus uh, savings to those people who have surplus savings. I mean, how many are they, and should they really ought to have had that, etc. I don't understand this, but there certainly are talk of doing cryptocurrencies for the biosphere, for protecting the biosphere after which you would, you would um, make money, or it would be an investment that you would get a return on eventually. Then also, there people are talking about blended finance. Here's what that means. Bloomberg Green is very good on this. Private capital doesn't want to invest in the developing world. It's too risky, and the returns are too low. So if governments would indemnify the risk, take on the insurance costs, if they would also make the original payments in the developing world to get things going, after which private finance could come in and do their usual thing and make profits off of it, then this is blended finance. And one has to groan. It's neoliberalism all over again. Um, public risk for private profit. For climate change, too, um, it's, an, it's an awful thought. And yet, in an all-hands-on-deck situation, and in a world where um, private capital is a really quite a bit huger than um, central banks' holdings, it could be that blended finance is a kind of deal with the devil that we're going to have to make. Um, there's a network for green in the financial system, and this is central banks, 89 of them, trying to figure out how to green money itself. So that's my ministry's carbon coin. They started in 2017. I didn't even know they existed when I wrote my book. I'm glad to know they do exist. There's also now the G-Feds. So the, the federal banks, the Federal Reserve Banks of the G20, of the G7, of the G2, they're getting together to talk about the greening of, of money on their levels. And since these are the major emitters, if they were to um, alter the finances towards greenness, in their own economies, the rest of the world would be the beneficiary. Now let me go back to the petrostates. What about them? Well, think of the carbon coin again. You, you, you suck down a, a ton of carbon and CO2 from the atmosphere, put it in the ground or put it in your trees, put it in your aqua farm, whatever, and build with it, um, and you get a carbon coin. What if you had a, a ton of, of CO2 right on hand, but you didn't burn it in the first place, ought you not to get compensation? Isn't that kind of a carbon coin uh, equivalent? Well, many people who have proposed the carbon coin shudder with dismay when I bring this up. But it seemed like a logical um, follow-up on what they had proposed. And I also have to say that of all the ideas that I was um, um, putting out in much shorter bursts and Thank you for the opportunity to give a coherent talk rather than a five minute. Imagine giving this tech in five minutes. I've done it. It goes very fast. <laughs> um, compensation for the petro states. So say they would have to take a haircut. Say that, um, which is to say that their, the amount of money that they get would be discounted from what they would have gotten in 1990. Well, yeah, that makes sense. It's not worth anything. It's a stranded asset. We're paying them anyway to keep it in the ground. Also amortized, which is to say they get paid it over a century, just the same way they would get paid it if they had mined it and burned it or sold it. 
So over time, and maybe it'll be a, long, a discount over time, maybe it'll rise over time to show good behavior. I mean, again, the economists can play the game of numbers here and, and make it work. But the petro states are going to have to um, be compensated or else they are never going to be on board and they're going to be a force of disruption hugely and the effort is going to fail. So now this sounds like, this sounds quite bad. It sounds like paying back blackmail or an extortionist, uh, you know, pay me or I'll blow up the world. Well, yes. And at this point, you have to think about what used to get called real politic. Uh, in America, we know it mostly because of uh, Henry Kissinger, but really it's more like Bismarck, balance of powers. Let's assume every nation state is equally good and or bad and quit making moral judgments. Uh, you know, the land of the home, uh, uh, the, uh, the home of the brave, and the, the land of the free, the home of the brave, forget about it. Give me a break. 800 military bases, suffering on the borders, um, hammering imperial wars left, right, and center. Please, we don't want your moralism anymore. Real politic. All nation states, we need a balance of powers so that we don't start fighting again. Just balance them out. I'm thinking there needs to be an ecological version of real politic. Eco-real politic. In other words, Russia needs to get paid. Brazil needs to get paid. They need, uh, Saudi Arabia needs to get paid to keep it in the ground. Now, there's gonna be howls of dismay uh, at this notion, and there's gonna be a lot of fear. What happens to the world's economy if there's huge amounts of money getting paid essentially for nothing? Well, one could maybe put guardrails on that money. Maybe that money needs to go to decarbonization. Maybe it needs to go to clean energy. Here, there would be howls. You're messing with my sovereignty. Just give me my money so that I can corruptly put it in my own pockets. I mean, that happens in many a petro state. It will be an ongoing fight. But if the opportunity is there to avoid a depression, it should be taken. I want to. Um, everybody should read the new biography of John Maynard Keynes called The Price of Peace by Zachary Carter. Because what he reminds us is that Keynes, at, after World War I, he was brought in as a young economist. What should we do? He said, don't hit Germany with reparations they can't pay. It will wreck them. They will come back to bite you. Well, the French said, we hate those guys. They just wrecked us. We're going to make them pay um, until they squeal blood. And they did. And we got the 30s in World War II. Now, in, in the, when the Depression hit, um, FDR's brain trust called Keynes over from London and said, what should we do? And Keynes said, stimulus spend. And when times are tough, the government has to create jobs, spend money, go out there and do the Keynesian thing, as it's now called. Um, the government is a huge part of the economy. It sets the laws. It can direct the money. It can tax people progressively. It is the major force in economics. The market... A, it's a simplistic and um, often foolish and greedy algorithm only. The market is an algorithm. It's not the place where you, I, you and I go down and trade something. It's the name for a oversimple algorithm. So the market sometimes has to be seized. And in World War II, the British Treasury seized the Bank of England, said, we're spending money on what we need to to win this war. And everybody's on board together as a nation state. It's easy to decide that when bombs are falling on your home and you need to fight for your lives. Climate change, it's the world community against their own previous technology. This is a little vague compared to an actual war, but it's a war for the earth, it's a war for the biosphere that all of humanity, one thing you can say about it, we're all on one side together. We're all in one biosphere boat. At least we're, uh, humans at this point are not killing other humans over it. And yet, nevertheless, government to get through this mass extinction possibility, the governments of the world are going to have to seize their markets and direct them. And this, of course, is uh, another uh, a message that uh, raises eyebrows there. So Keynesian stimulus, without the idea of um, punishment for people who have used fossil fuels or, or countries that have fossil fuels that want to sell them, the moral uh, approbation that they get is entirely unwarranted. We have all grown up on fossil fuels. It's fueling these lights right now. And so to say, oh my gosh, Royal Dutch Shell, I saw the chair of Royal Dutch, tell, uh, Royal Dutch Shell take a, a horrific um, lecture on stage from a, a young activist who called him a war criminal and walked off the stage. 
And I'm thinking, well, good theater, but on the other hand, your veins run with fossil fuels. And so your protests that self-righteousness is an is a addictive drug. It's not good for you, self-righteousness. And, in, and especially when it's not warranted, and especially when we need to dodge the mass extinction event. So we're going to be into a... Um, a multivariant, unconstrained experiment in the next 20, 30 years, where I believe that something like three to four trillion dollars per year are gonna have to be made up from scratch and, and paid to petrostates, to developing nations who clean, need clean energy to replace their dirty energy, and to everybody who decarbonizes, um, and to stimulate uh, decarbonization work and make it the highest rate of return or the best rate of return for workers so that you're not um, suffering to save the world but actually making your living at it. Now, immediately one says to that amount of money per year per year, oh my God, that's too much, we're gonna have inflation. Well, the world economy is like 75 um, a trillion, um, the GWP, 75 trillion per year. If four million of them are new and are, are given to decarbonization, it isn't clear that that's going to add up to inflation. And also, anytime you tax corporations and the rich, they are so sad that immediately you get deflation. You've got some control knobs on the economy. So, um, and also, macroeconomics, you hear people argue, well, that'll, do, that'll make massive inflation. No, that will make massive deflation. No, that won't do anything at all. And this is the state of macroeconomics in our time. So um, there's a bit of art to it, and there's obviously a lot of ideology. So um, I'm coming to the end here, and I just want to say that um, these macro politics, this macro economics, um, since we're very near Hollywood, I want to quote the great William Goldman, no one knows anything. <laughs> we're in an experiment. And there is not a science of macroeconomics. That's almost like saying a science of history or Isaac Asimov's psychohistory. Oh yes, we can scientifically predict what will happen from what happened in the past. No way, that's not the case. So every time people talk about what's gonna happen if you do something, that's a science fiction story. I'm a science fiction writer. I recognize them when I see them. And so each time someone says, well, that's sure to happen if you do X or Y, I'm thinking, well, that's either a good science fiction story or a bad one, but it's definitely a science fiction story only because the future can't be predicted. So there are other things to talk about, and I just want to end with the idea that habitat restoration, keeping uh, corridors open for wildlife, dodging the mass extinction event means taking care of our wild animals. 97% of the meat on this planet is humans and their domestic beasts. That means 3% of the meat on the planet is all the wild animal species. They're in terrible trouble and we need to protect them. You also have um, regenerative agriculture. We could draw carbon down by our growing food in the right ways. Um, aquaculture could be sustainable and even clean water if you grow the right mussels and clams. Biochar, reforestation, uh, clean energy of all kinds, and carbon capture. This is an interesting thing where we're going to have to suck some CO2 to the atmosphere no matter how virtuous we are from now on. If we were to even stop right now, we might want some gigatons of CO2 out of the air by, captured by natural or mechanical means. So carbon capture is going to be a thing. Um, everything has got to be on the table because we're in an emergency and Anything that you thought that you knew, like, oh, geoengineering, that's, that's a snow piercer. Or, oh my god, um, nuclear power, that's Three Mile Island or Fukushima. All of that actually has to be set aside and looked at newly in the face of the crisis. We need clean energy, we need um, habitat corridors, we need carbon out of the atmosphere. We might need to bounce some sunlight away from us to keep us from dying. All these things have to be on the table, even for a good leftist environmentalist like myself. And I find it quite shocking, but I think with that kind of notion that open your mind to anything, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you for an extremely dense and compacted talk. Let me ask
ask a couple of clarification questions to start with. So um, when you talk about a mass extinction event, I think um, toward the end you were talking explicitly about habitat restoration, so it seemed to be in the context of biodiversity loss, but during a lot of your talk, it wasn't clear whether you were talking about human extinction or extinction of other species. Could you clarify that? Also because what does climate change exactly have to do with extinction, given that so many species go extinct because of land use changes, habitat destruction, and reasons that are not directly coming from climate change? Could you just clarify that? Because you used that term a lot, mass extinction. Um, a mass extinction event is referring to the previous five. The sixth great mass extinction event has to do with the number of species on the planet. Climate change is usually involved, although habitat and um, loss is a big part of it too. The UN, the IPCC, has recently declared that the uh, biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are one and the same. And I don't mean human extinction, which is not quite possible given our, our cleverness and um, our ability to get by, there will be pockets. We could have a, a mass deaths. We could, we could lose a big percentage of humanity and it would be a, a, a disaster and a crime forever. But it wouldn't be extinction for us. It's the other species that is the crime we can't come back from. So that's what I mean by okay. that. Okay, good. Thank you for, for clarifying that. So I want to ask you more about this, the, the carbon coin and carbon currency idea, which I, which I liked a lot in the Ministry for the Future. But I'm still not quite sure how it's going to work. So um, in your talk, you said, okay, so this means we pay, say, Nigeria and Saudi Arabia to keep their oil in the ground, right? We keep Russia to keep its gas in the ground. So who's going to pay? The central banks. The 89 central banks are going to pay. The humanity is going to pay. I, I was hoping I was made that clear. Um, the money is a matter of, uh, it's a medium of exchange, it's a storage of value, it's a sign of social trust. It needs the backing of, uh, when I give you a dollar for a cup of coffee or five dollars for a cup of coffee, then you take it and give me the coffee because you know that you can use that five dollars to get something else that you want. Um, that being the case, Money is invented and backed by states. It's a, it's a, it was invented as a method of taxing people in the beginning of civilization. So um, that's who's going to pay for it. Now, you could, there are people who don't like modern monetary theory, who would like to stick with Keynesianism, who would like to keep um, um, price and value and labor connected to each other. And so if you're going to put out that much new money, you need to take it back in. And, a solvent, as if you were a private citizen. Governments are not private citizens and they make money, so that's a very contested point in economics. But even if you agreed with that, what you would do is progressive taxation. You would tax corporations, you would tax the wealth. They would be progressive like at the end of World War II, where at the end of World War II, um, people who made more than $400,000 a year paid 93% of the overage to the federal government. So that's progressive taxation with teeth. Everybody accepted it because they felt that the wealthy people were somewhat implicated in the creation of World War II in the first place. It was a different structure of feeling. Um, we kind of need that again. Uh, excessive wealth is not good for anybody, including the excessively wealthy. So you could, if you wanted to do a balance of payments thing, say, well, let's just tax enough to make these payouts, and the payouts would be for decarbonizing. But it's also the case that many economists argue that you could quantitatively ease a certain amount of money every year without freaking people out. It's an experiment. So could you explain that a little bit more? Forgive me, I'm an English major, like yourself. Um, so let's take the example of Australia. So um, we pay them to keep um, all their coal and iron ore and so forth in the ground. Right. Um, so who pays for that? Is it Why doesn't that get us into exactly the same fight that we're now having at the cops? That is... Um, that some people think those who historically emitted the most greenhouse gas emissions should pay, or those who currently emit the most. Um, so why, why wouldn't that be the same fight all over again? And in Australia, whom would you, I mean, if you, if you tell these big cor corporations, Rio Tinto, BHP Billiton, and so forth, to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, then what do you tax them on? I mean, these companies, they don't, have a, they don't have income anymore, right? So whom do, you, whom do you then impose that 
that progressive taxation on. Can you make that a little bit clearer? Many of the private fossil fuel companies, they just ought to be uh, nationalized. They're on national land. They're, they've got leases. Um, since 80% of, of fossil fuels are already nationalized, the private companies are a minor problem. But you could certainly drive them out of business and then take their assets. Private companies are an easy problem. You just simply uh, legislate them out of business. Like your pollution is too bad. Uh, you need to pay 100 US dollars per ton of, of, um, of your product sold to us as the true cost of what you did. Those private companies wouldn't make a profit anymore. Shareholders would go away. Investors would go away. Those companies would crash. They'd go crying to their governments. The governments would take over the assets. Private companies are not the problem. Nation states that depend on that income are the problem. With them, what you would have to say is the world community is going to compensate you financially. And it's true. I said it uh, in, earlier in the talk. People don't like to give away money. But what if it wasn't your money? What if it was, we just made up $100. You can have it. It didn't even exist before. So this is what quantitative easing does. Carbon quantitative easing is maybe loosening the purse strings of the a general selfishness of anybody that's got money. So that would be the theory. And then because there's 89 central banks discussing this, um, currency speculators, of course, would try to put a run on this thing. You could actually kill this new carbon coin by various kinds of financial speculation. It would be defended by long-term bonds that central banks were backing. And that buying of those long-term bonds by pension funds, by investment and hedge funds, would be an income for the central banks to say that we're actually backing this new quantitative easing that we're doing. Now, listen, I'm an English major too, and so you, you have caught me. <laughs> well, we have some almost, economists here, so. You've caught me at almost the further edge of my ability to explain this, but that's, how, that's my impression, and I would refer you to um, the Network for Greening the Financial System, who has a white paper on this. I refer you to the papers by Delton Chen and the Carbon Reward Group that is uh, out of Australia itself, and to Modern Monetary Theory, which has a very strong advocates at New York University and in Australia. And Modern Monetary Theory is interesting because they say there's two parts to this, in this um, that you can quantitatively ease and you're not like a household, that governments creating money can therefore create more than existed before. It's always happened. And B, job guarantee. The, the modern monetary theory always says the new money created should make for a job guarantee for every human on earth. That would get rid of unemployment. That would get rid of wage pressure, as private industry calls it. In other words, fear in people's hearts that if they don't take a bullshit job, as Graeber put it, that they won't have anything at all, so they take low wages and, and um, private industry likes it for there to be 5% unemployment. If there's less than 5% unemployment, the stock market freaks out because they're scared that wage pressure will go away. If there was a job guarantee that came through governments, then you would have a, a different political economy at that point. Why don't you take a step back and I wanted to ask you one more abstract, slightly more abstract question about um, these economic ideas and then I wanted to um, segue to bringing in some of the ideas or some of the what the Ministry for the Future does in this context. So um, uh, one of the questions that for me arose both from reading um, most of your novels and from this talk is so what do you what do you see as the role of the state because at the end of New York 2140 you seem to sort of propose that okay socialization of banks socialization of companies um, state-owned companies is the way out of the current crisis. But then you've just brought up the fact that 75% um, of current fossil fuel resources are already owned by states, and that hasn't done anybody any good. So um, what, how do you see the role of the state, and what kind of state would it have to be for this to work as a way out of the crisis? Well, I, we're in a nation-state system, and we have a biosphere crisis that we need to deal with in the next 10 years by a massive technology transfer. So we got to go with what we've got, the nation-state system. I spoke to this a little bit. When nation-states turn into member states, a certain amount of sovereignty has been given to the commune, to the, to the totality. You said, I will go along with the consensus here and even giant empires like America and China are signatories to the Paris Agreement. So, um, the, you could, one thing I've been doing is try to put um, political ideas 
and leftist political hopes and dreams on a timeline. So, which is to say from now out to, let's say 300 years from now. So on that timeline, what we need right now is to get that bill through the Senate. Okay, that's now. That's on the table, we gotta do it, whatever it takes to squeak that working majority through. Um, five years out, if we've defeated austerity and gotten back to Keynesianism, which was what was serving the world so well in the post-war 30 years, Keynesianism rather than austerity and neoliberalism. That's a great goal to fight for, and it needs immediate attention because neoliberalism is the name for our disaster. That, that economic system will indeed cause the mass extinction of it. After that, well, social democracy. I mean, if the whole world ran by the rules of Denmark, would the world be better? Yes, it would be better, people and planet. Social democracy, then, I don't know, democratic socialism. This has been a, a dream for a lot of us for a long time. Maybe that's a, a step 100 years out. Maybe by that time it'll be named something different. Maybe it'll be some kind of new collectivist name and we will dispense with 19th century names as being too scary or too inaccurate. And then out to, think about anarchism, a complete horizontalization of power and wealth and prosperity. Everybody on the planet's got it equally. I take it that that's what anarchism is talking about. Not a lack of uh, laws, but a lack of rulers. Anarchy in Greek could be either one. Lack of rulers, not lack of laws. Because you need laws with eight billion people. And if that's your ultimate goal, if you say, I'm an anarchist, Stan, and I say, yeah, I'm an anarchist too, you know, in 300 years, I hope we're there. But meanwhile, I want that bill passed tomorrow in the Senate. So if you timeline your leftism, the backbiting, the stabbing in the back, the narcissism of small differences, and the historical fact that the left has killed each other while the right sits there laughing and comes and cleans up the mess and wins. These fights among the left are people who are at different points in the timeline imaginary. And they ought to give up on it and realize that there's a process that needs to be worked through to get to whatever point you think is optimal. Okay, that brings it to, I have to ask you one more question about that since you brought up Denmark. So um, a lot of your work is about finding alternatives to capitalism. And I've heard you talk about post-capitalism a lot. Last time I looked, Denmark was a capitalist country. So the, my question would be, is the realistic choice right now between different varieties of capitalism rather than alternatives to capitalism and capitalism? We're in neoliberal capitalism, but each one of these versions of capitalism have different um, amounts of sheer force applied, different amounts of immiseration. Um, it's always been bad, it's always been a power relation. There is always gonna be capital. That's the useful residue of human labor. That's investment money. That's uh, organized and targeted human work for good causes. So capital itself is not a bad thing, nor money, nor economics. Capitalism is the name for 1% gets to have 50% of the wealth and then 50% poorest gets to have the other half. In other words, the power relation of the few able to exploit and appropriate from the many that do the work. That system needs to change. It's better in Denmark, and Denmark is capitalist, but this is, these are, there's a huge difference between social democracy and neoliberalism, which has to do with the welfare state and the, and the social security at the floor of the social democracies. And then there's pretty progressive taxation, so there's a bit of a ceiling, although a ceiling isn't as important as a floor. It would be good for human solidarity if there weren't billionaires and if you got taxed out of that, if that was impossible in tax terms, people would feel a little more esprit de corps as the human race. But the really important thing is the floor, and indeed the social democracies have that. So I don't, I mean, again, you use the big words like, oh, they're all capitalism, so there's no distinction to be made. Yes, there is. There's distinctions to be made in these political economies. They're important enough to fight for, and especially if you're trying to make a stepwise system and get better and deal with the emergency as well, you have to grab the one closest to you. This is why, here I am, I mean, believe me, I was, um, my draft member was 89 in the Vietnam War. I mean, I am a Vietnam War um, student radical from the late 60s, early 70s, essentially an ancient hippie leftist. <laughs> and I'm saying to you, 
Keynesianism is our salvation. <laughs> I mean, if, I, if, if, the, if the, me 50 years ago looked at that and said, Stan, um, why have you caved so badly? I would have to explain to my younger self, you know, here's where we are, this is what I think we need to do, and um, hope for the best. Sold out to the man. Um, so let me, let me shift the, the conversation a little bit um, to narrative, and then I want to open it up to, to um, questions and comments and thoughts that you all might have. Um, so you have a couple of COP conferences that are described in the book. So how did the real thing compare? Because, I mean, I think it, you wrote this before you actually attended a COP, or had you oh, attended a no, uh, yeah, uh, so, no. So how did it compare? I mean, you had made up COP conferences that didn't have novelists in them in the novel. Um, so... Uh, so how, what was the real thing like compared to what you wrote about, what you anticipated? It wasn't grossly off. Young people are doing the work in these conferences. Um, they're um, young hotshot lawyers and diplomats, and they are idealistic and they're doing hard work and the details like I described in my talk. And I have that in the book. Um, a probably good thing I hadn't been to a COP because this book is already too long and it might end up like three times longer with more meetings, which I'm already notorious for. And really, I don't want to write another meeting in my entire life. Um, it's not a natural dramatic moment in, until, you know, people start jumping across the table and trying to kill each other, which sometimes happens. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was... The scene in Glasgow was the same as seeing Village Homes, which I moved into after writing Pacific Edge. A weird sense of, oh man, I, I, I thought I had made that up, but in fact it really, it really happened. Now that's true for, there are ministries for the future. I met a real Mary Murphy, I met Mary Robinson, and also the carbon coin is a real thing that I didn't even know about. Also pulling water out from underneath the glaciers, for those who have read the book, that's a real plan, not something that I, it was suggested to me by a crazy glaciologist. That was true, but it turns out it's a real plan as well. So in other words, I'm barely able to keep up. I mean, a working science fiction writer, and I'm thinking the, the present is too fast for me, but I'll just, um, it's like the Chinese say, once you're riding a tiger, it's very hard to get off. So I just ride the tiger and hope for the best. Uh, for those of you who've read the book, and maybe some of Stan's other work, you know that the structure of the novel is really distinctive. It has a lot of different voices. It has a different perspectives and fragments. Um, and you've done this in quite a few novels, and it comes from you know, the legacy of, of modernist novelists, especially John Dos Passos. But here you went one step further, and you included voices not just from a lot of different regions, a lot of different social classes, races, ethnicities, um, especially in that one chapter, there's one chapter where there's, um, you know, dozens of different voices from different countries that um, bring their ideas on how to deal with a crisis to the table. I love that chapter. It was really, the really great um, bringing together of, of the most diverse voices from around the globe. But one thing you do hear that I, I don't think you've done in previous novels, and that is you include non-human voices. So we have one short passage where it's herd animals that talk to humans, reindeer, caribou, elephants, another one where a photon talks, um, and some others where the speaker is not identified, but it could be something as abstract as DNA or something like that. What made you take that step to giving voices to non-humans, and then how could we translate that into the politics that we're currently at? That is, how could we represent these non-human voices that, you know, if indeed we're facing a mass extinction event, should have a seat at the table in some, however, symbolic form. How would we do that? What are your ideas on that? Well, it's very often a question of legal standing. Uh, so you come into a court and the judge says, but you don't have standing in this case. And particularly if um, you're a tree, or say you're a lawyer saying that you're representing a tree or a forest, you come into a court and the judge says, well, sorry, you don't have standing in this case. Legal standing is important, and over historical time, from the ancient Greeks till now, the umbrella of um, humans that have legal standing has gotten bigger, and this is one of the achievements of human civilization. Um, uh, and, it, and of course it's always subject to shrinkage and to argumentation, but over time still you would say that legal standing for more and more 
humans has become the norm until you get the UN Declaration of Human Rights, very um, idealistic, and yet saying everybody has the same human rights, and that cannot be traduced or le legislated out of existence. Okay, now um, Ecuador declared its forest to be a citizen. Um, Wales declared its back country to be a citizen. Um, there's many children's defense groups saying children can't speak for themselves very well and therefore need to have legal standing as such and represented by their lawyers if you extend that outwards. The other thing I was thinking is actor network theory, which comes out of science and technology studies. And, and believe me, my younger academic friends, when I say I'm so excited about actor network theory, they're like, Stan, actually that was 1984 and, and we've critiqued the hell out of actor network theory and it turns out that actors that don't have agency are very different from actors who do have agency. So um, it was a bogus theory to begin with, but I really like it still. Me actor too. network theory. Yeah. So one of the actors in my life has been the Sierra Nevada of California, a mountain range, giant actor in my life. Agency, well, it's hard to say. But I wanted to write those voices in and just pretend that they were speaking as in an Italo Calvino short story. I mean, Calvino did this all the time in Cosmic Comics, etc. And it's, it's, it's Aesop's fables, right? The animals get to speak too. So it's an old habit and I just threw it in there for the fun of it. One thing when you write a book about climate change and meetings and mass death, the fun factor is kind of hard to identify. <laughs> and so I thought, um, the play of forms, I'm gonna throw in riddles. The Anglo-Saxon is great on riddles. About a third of the written Anglo-Saxon we have are riddles without the answers provided. And so the scholars look for answers to these riddles and there's one great riddle where the answer is either, either a grasshopper or an angel. And of course that was on purpose. There's a lot of phallic jokes, there's a lot of double entendres. These riddles are meant to have a, a, a deceptive answer and then a real answer or whatever but they're not written down in the records, and so scholars argue about this. Uh, riddles, um, um, animal tales, r BBC radio dialogues, um, which I quite enjoyed, um, and eyewitness accounts. So eyewitness accounts were super important because an eyewitness account is not the same as a fictional scene in a novel. It's more compressed, it cuts to the chase, it judges things, it does things that in fiction you're enjoined, oh, show, don't tell. And then an eyewitness sits down and tells you their story, like the Ancient Mariner. I love that extremely. <laughs> and in fact, all the rules out of writing workshops, I love to reverse them. Of course you tell, you don't show. You're not, in a, you're not a mime. You gotta tell. And so reversing the rules of MFA programs is one of my favorite hobbies. All right, let's open it up. Um, do people wanna ask questions or, or give responses? Yeah, I think you wanted to. Hi, um, my name is Melita Watts, and just for fun, I'll share with you, I wrote a book called Tree from the Point of View of a Tree, so I feel some empathy here. But I'm really interested on a really serious level in um, your idea of purchasing underground oil and keeping it underground. And I think it can be compared to what we've done in the United States for open space acquisition. And the two mechanisms are you get a conservation easement, which ties it up forever, or you buy it and then you own it and you hope that a good guy like NPS owns it or whatever. So my concern is, if you try look down, say, to Brazil, we have Bolsonaro, who's allowing fires to be set on purpose so that historic forests can become forced into farmland, I'm concerned that our efforts to keep um, you know, gas underground only work if you have a coherent government in charge. So a conservation easement is only as good as the credibility of the United States. If we lost the United States, all those lands would be turned into something else. So how do we... How do we make it stick on a global level? It's a great idea, but the devil's on the details, right? It is, and I think this is a real and severe problem, of course. But um, Lula might beat Bolsonaro in the next election. <laughs> he's been absolved of the crimes, he's out of jail, he's running again, and Lula could beat Bolsonaro. The idea that Biden beat Trump has scared every autocrat on this planet that, oh my God, does, is democracy really real in the United States? We had no idea. <laughs> um, and so um, everybody in India, in Hungary, and even in Russia, all of these places where they run elections, those elections could go to um, forces that are in favor of the earth. And so you need mass movements. One thing that I maybe haven't emphasized enough is that young people 
moving in mass movements, people doing Extinction Rebellion type disruption, uh, gluing yourself to the doors of banks or hedge funds and, and, um, and getting yourself tossed in jail overnight. All these mass actions put the feet to the fire of get this done for our sake. And so these are necessary things across the board to get a working political majority, which could be squeaky, squeaky close. But if it works, then 10 years later, you, you have to fight it again. And there's nothing left but politics and the consistent fight this way, because we are in a nation state system. So we have to give Brazil what support we can, but um, you can try to sanction Brazil. And indeed, Putin recently said, you know, if you guys weren't hammering us with sanctions over us taking Crimea back into Mother Russia where it has been forever and ever, we would probably do more green things, wouldn't we? And so you can see the real politic again of making deals to save the planet and not being too um, uh, self-righteous about it. Thank you. Yeah. This question actually builds on what you were beginning to say with mass movements. Um, first, thanks for the talk and the terrific novel. Um, I really appreciate in the novel how, in a sense, un surprisingly, technocrats become heroes, right? That there is, um, that within the possible um, and uh, even the rational and, you know, what, where we don't expect it, there is radical action eventually. But there's also Frank May, the character who suffers the um, horrible heat wave and uh, pushes the Ministry for the Future to take much more radical action. And they're the children of Kali who use violence tactically, um, assassinating climate criminals. Um, and I wonder if you can speak more to uh, the role of escalating um, militant action um, at, at, at this moment and maybe 10 years from now, given that you spoke about timelines specifically. And I think that's a really useful way to to think about this. I mean, that, this may be, you know, asking in advance of the time when we answer that in a sense, but I'm not only speaking in the sense of violence, which I think in the, in the role, in, in the novel actually plays a very, very tactical role and a limited role. Um, uh, and I, I admire that within the novel that it's, it's thought of so precisely. Um, uh, but just to say, so, so you know, there's authors like Andreas Malm who are talking about now um, that we move towards blowing up pipelines. Um, what if we have consciousness for the creatures of the future? Um, how do we think about uh, both the extra parliamentary or extra UN actions? And also, I think another part of the question, not to make it too big, is also um, the role of what is not rational or technocratic. That humans also have um, a kind of death drive, they have despair, they have anger, uh, there are you know, millions of people who live without um, the kind of dignity that allows for the calculations of um, a, a carbon coin, of, of, of sort of systems that are thought of from um, a, a very rational social de democratic sort of top-down manner. Um, so, so that's a big question, but... <laughs> that's okay, yeah. that is a good question and important. And I would say the Ministry for the Future is not a good thinking tool for this particular topic because it imitates the mess of history itself. And if things get as bad as they get in the Ministry for the Future's first chapter, they're gonna be very angry people who are gonna be doing stuff that might hurt the cause, but they're too angry. They want revenge more than they want um, a good result. And that violence will get unleashed on us and it won't really help. Malm is important, how to blow up a pipeline. What he's saying is that nonviolent resistance succeeded in the 20th century because the powers that be made a concession to nonviolent resistance to avoid more violent groups on the edge of the nonviolent resistors. So you deal with Martin Luther King Jr. so that you don't get Malcolm X. This is a kind of a classic example that Malm himself brings up. Bill McKibben says no, that's not the way it happened. People weren't scared of Malcolm X. They were scared of Martin Luther King Jr. and his um, millions of supporters. And so he brings into support uh, Erica Chenoweth's uh, Why Civil Resistance Works, another very good text on this, that uh, civil resistance works because once a society has even 15% doing um, staged resistance to the economic system, that changes laws more than violent resistance movement changes laws. Now these historical studies, social studies, are all um, um, 
tend, they're picking the evidence they want to support the case in a, in a teleological or ideological fashion. But we all do that. And it's worth reading these people and thinking seriously about your own sense of history and your own sense of what you would do. What Malm is good at is there's a difference between murder and sabotage. And there's a point at which people in the developed nations, young people, seeing their world go down in flames, might want to glue themselves to the glass doors of a hedge fund and say, um, I'm here and I protest. And that's not harming, any, that's not a physical violence against another person and certainly not murder. So that, in my novel, the children of Kali are um, survivors of a mass catastrophe, mass death, and they're angry. And what they're doing may or may not be tactically helpful compared to n nonviolent resistance. As, a, as an ordinary American middle class citizen, I'd say do the legal thing until the point where you can maybe get yourself arrested overnight. Don't hurt people. And don't even annoy people in the middle by blocking them on their way to work and then losing their support for your cause, which often happens in Britain with Extinction Rebellion. Tactics and strategy need to be more carefully thought out. What gains you the sympathy of the people observing? And, and here you need to listen to McKibben, you need to listen to Malm and Chenoweth, and Ministry for the Future would just be like a case study of, oh my God, if things got bad enough, it could, get, it, it could even come to this. And I guess that's how I would, there's a lot of squiggling, and you, when you read ministry and you think about this question, you see a lot of squiggling, a lot of authorial nervousness, and <laughs> it's there. The danger of trying to paraphrase a writer, it sounds as if politically you were saying three, on a 300 year timeline, effectively a revolution, but getting there by evolution to do what it takes now to get through them all and pass the bill, as you said. Is that a fair paraphrase? Well, yes. Um, um, okay. Paraphrases, here's the way I would put it. There's a really interesting book by a Robert Meister, um, an economist and social scientist at UC Santa Cruz. And what he said was, could we gain the benefits of a revolution without the violence and disruption of a revolution by way of um, legal claims on profit? Um, in other words, citizen shareholders, citizen revolts, um, strikes, and household actions. The Santa Cruz uh, rethinking capitalist um, project that Meister headed, and his books, although they're dense in a way that is like dying and somewhat hard to understand, nevertheless, his question is a good one. Could we do it by way of, of um, creating working political majorities to get the right legislation done to get us out of this without violence? And, and the answer is, of course, unknown, but it's certainly worth trying as one of the main strategies that we follow. Oh, hi. Uh, you said at the beginning, um, you used this phrase of quantified ethics, and you wanted to redo an algorithm with new goals. And that phrase stuck out to me because there's things that economists quantify and there's things that seem unquantifiable by philosophers, like the feeling of loss when you know a butterfly, well, that species of butterfly will never, or the rights of a polar bear versus the rights of someone in India whose, um, whose home is destroyed from a tsunami. So I was just wondering, um, if you have imagined, or if you could even imagine for us, how you would kind of populate that new algorithm with terms that kind of do the translation between things that seem quantifiable and things that don't, that, that haven't been historically, right? It's hard to, in, moral, in the history of moral philosophy, to quantify um, moral obligation to non-human others. Yes, and some people would object to the process of quantification as cheapening the, the value of what is effectively an infinity. So, okay, what's the value of a human life? Infinity. But wait, it's $5 million, and therefore Ford can make a cost-benefit analysis and realize they don't have to change the gas tank in the Pinto because they'll pay out less in insurance than they would fix the car. And this is an insurance um, a, a decision about what a human life is worth. Some people would say, look, you cannot pay me enough to keep wolves on my land. You could pay me a million dollars a year at, for being a wolf keeper on my land, and I wouldn't do it, because I like to shoot them on sight, because I hate them. So these, these um, non-fungible <laughs> uh, non -non tokens, but um, sacred 
beliefs that are beyond economic calculation, that's interesting. That's maybe behavioral economics or maybe it's philosophy again. Um, and then, but what I would say is that if economics was detached and used as a tool to analyze the axioms that you believe are shared by everybody, I often bring up Aldo Leopold, what's good is what's good for the land. Now this is a very powerful algorithmic or axiomatic statement. And for the land, let's say for the biosphere, what's good is what's good for the biosphere. So okay, I'm going to buy this pineapple um, plantation on the north side of Maui. I'm gonna pull up the pineapples and I'm gonna grow one of every kind of endangered palm tree in the whole Pacific Basin. This is the great poet W.S. Merwin. That was his life's project. Um, this is what's good for the, the biosphere. And so therefore, although he just did it as an act of love and paid for every palm tree that he put in, you could imagine a, a carbon coin where, or a biodiversity coin where people said, man, can, we, can you do the whole north side of Maui, please? The, the subject needs to be distranded to where economics is not the valuation. It's philosophy and, and ethics. It's, it's ideology. And then economics simply becomes another social science tool like sociology and gets taken out of the capitalist realism of cynical reason of, well, the economist told me that I could do this, therefore I can do this. And, and that delinkage and moving from economics back to political economy is, I think, a, a very necessary move. Otherwise, economics is just part of a power play. So, you've been, um, uh, you've been uh, talking about and writing about these tremendously creative and exciting economic ideas. And I just think that in addition to the economics, I think we need an equal degree of political creativity um, especially at the world level, you know, how do we get around this one nation, one vote, consensus, treaties that are fundamentally unenforceable system? What can we do, you know, in the, um, in the short term and on the time scale of a few decades? I think we need a comparable de degree of creativity, both economically and in terms of our political structures? Well, this is a very hard question. I, um, from nation state to member state, um, from, and the Paris Agreement. Let's think of the Paris Agreement as a new thing in in world history that'll get a page. If there's human history being written 5,000 years from now, the Paris Agreement will get a page or a paragraph. And, why, and now, I say this as a science fiction story, being set 5,000 years in the future, blah, blah, but also because the Paris Agreement could turn into the League of Nations. In other words, a good idea that failed and then we had a massive world war. Um, you have to make these promises come true. It's just like what I, the comparison I made to a, a wedding vow. You have to make it come true by the life that you live afterwards. Um, given where we are now, nation states are incredibly jealous of sovereignty and of their own budgets and of the money that they've got and of their citizens. They are hired, governments are, to defend their citizens and it's a, it's a power relation. There were good arguments that the whole thing is a kind of a a game for the powerful to um, uh, exploit the weak. But given that it's what we've got, I think that um, I don't want to uh, take a single leap to heaven because I don't know what that heaven would be. The world government, well, come on. We're not there now, but we have international relationships and we are in a global economy. So if you focus on economics, you're talking about a world government which is called global capitalism. WTO, all of those trade treaties, all of these things are global. In that sense, they're good. They're world government. If they're, the form is good, the content is rotten because you can still exploit people and you can still play off labor forces against each other and these are legal under the laws of the international uh, global capitalist regime. If those same forms said, you've got to protect biodiversity, you've got to have justice for your people, all of the employees in your country are co-owners of all your company's businesses and get equal shares out of the business involved, the same form would have a different content. 
So, um, I mean, maybe this is, comes from my, my, my leftist upbringing. Politics and economics are just two aspects of the same fused thing. And so if you change the economics, you are in fact changing the politics and maybe vice versa. So I guess that's as far as I can go with that. Okay, last question. So I, I think your economic model has a lot of, a lot of promise. Um, but the thing that concerns me is that the people who have to really buy into it, mainly the capitalists and the, the politicians that they, they support, um, are going to fight us tooth and nail for so long that we're going to run out of time. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you say this model to people and they're not going to see the potential profit in it, the trillions that you mentioned, uh, until they get convinced by something that feels very tangible to them. So my, my question really comes down to, I think a bunch of us progressive liberals in here are very happy to listen to you, but we don't have the money. So if you were in a room with a hundred of those people that you really need to convince, what do you think you would say to them to really get their greed going and motivate them with the power they have to do what they need to do because we can't fight them for another 30 years? Yeah. For sure, we're in a short-term situation. And I have indeed talked to um, rooms of venture capitalists that they're in rooms like this, lots of venture capitalists. The Silicon Valley loves their science fiction. I mean, obviously. So um, the opportunity to talk to Silicon Valley comes um, like too frequently. Um, and what I wanna say is that um, this notion of blended finance, I would agree with you that most capitalists would like to save the world while holding on to their privilege, power, and security for them and their children. So they're not going to say, oh, well, I'm tax the hell out of me. I, do, I only want 10 times as much as adequacy, which is what I would suggest is the obvious wage parity, because 10 times adequacy is luxury and you don't need more. Well, the room is like, wait a second, I need way more than 10 times adequacy to support my lifestyle and keep my kids safe. There is that attitude. There's no doubt about it. Um, nobody likes to give away money. And everybody, once they've got a whole lot of money, they're thinking, well, yeah, I, I'm such a genius. I did it myself by my hard work and by my brilliance. I mean, I deserve it. I deserve it. This is so common. But it's a very human response. You can say to them, um, there are great investment opportunities in saving the world. Or you can say to them, when the world's gone smash and you have no food and you can't buy any food, then your money means nothing whatsoever. It's just a big load of, of metal in your safe. So um, for your own self-interest, so again, enlightened self-interest is the way that you would have to speak to the capitalist crowd. Um, for, your, for your kid's good, for your good, like say you're a, a, a young capitalist and you're, you've just made a, a million and you're 30. You say, well, you know, your sperm count is like 25% of what your grandfather's sperm count was. Do you know why that is? That's because this world is so polluted because we don't pay for the true cost of what we do by poisoning things. And if we had progressive taxation and you only made a million dollars rather than $50 million, you know, we might have a healthier world and you might have healthier children as well. And they're thinking, wait, 25% sperm count to my grandpa? <laughs> you know, this is, this is the factoid that sticks in their head. And yet it's true. So you go on from there and try to um, essentially try to blast people's minds a little bit. Um, this is what a science fiction writer is good for. And since we're at the final question, I guess I can get goofy. I mean, Ursula, I feel like uh, this is like one of those, you, you know how you have dreams where you're caught in front of an audience trying to answer an orals exam in a, in a, in a subject that you haven't studied and you know nothing about? And going, well, I, I think I have a solution here. And you hope that you wake up. <laughs> so now I'm going to uh, wake up and go to dinner. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.